Hello, BookTube. The great Victorian novelist Anthony Trollope is famous for having written two series of books, his Barchester books that are so beloved, and his Palliser novels, the parliamentary novels that we read last year. We read them in sequence. Uh, and that has led to a tendency to some people to think of him as the author of those books and to maybe just a bit neglect the fact that he also wrote an entire bookcase of standalone novels. Uh, that weren't part of any series, although, as several people have pointed out, they do share a shared universe. The characters pop up all through Trollope. Uh, there's no such, no such thing really, except for his historical fiction, there's no such thing really as an insular Trollope novel. But nevertheless, for all of 2020, we are going to pay attention to those solitary, standalone books. For all of 2020, we are going to be consorting with lonely Trollopes. <laughs> and, and all of uh, the month of March, the disastrous, doomed chronicle of March, a month that will go down in human history with a gigantic black mark next to its name. We couldn't have known that when we made these plans and when we started. And all throughout the month of March, we've been reading Trollope's biggest lonely Trollope, <laughs> the, the way we live now. His 1875 novel, uh, uh, just a scathing satirical look at every layer of life in the London that was letting him down, in the modern world that he was disliking the more he looked at it, uh, and that elicited from him in this book as several of you have noted, uh, a sharper tongue than, than the mild criticisms of society and people and buffoons that fill his other novels. This is, this is a, a very markedly different tone, I would argue, especially at the first half of the book. Uh, and that set readers on edge and, and gave critics no end of, uh, of delight in tearing it to pieces. Not They were helped in that by the fact that Trollope attacks their own profession. This is a withering look at the world of professional book reviewing, just withering. Uh, I want to hasten to add in the year of our Lord 2020 that it's not entirely accurate. <laughs> and that, that, or rather, it is for a certain kind of the literary world, but not for all of it. Nevertheless, uh, our main character, our, our the I won't call her heroine, she's false from head to toe, we're told, but Lady Carberry is an aspiring writer. She's written a, a, by all accounts, disastrously bad work called Criminal Queens, a kind of a Bill O'Reilly uh, cheapening and misreading of historical sources to give a series of very colorful portraits of famous and infamous women in history. Uh, and she has made nice. She has cozied up to three literary editors in London to try and get it a soft reception, to try and get it good reviews. And has, where we learn in the course of this book, it's never stressed, but she has largely succeeded in doing that. Uh, even the negative review she got, she had one negative review. We read about the reviewer, Mr. Jones, who's, uh, who, who tore her book apart with gleeful malignity. <laughs> but, uh, but even that was better than indifference. Her, her publisher tells her very wisely that nothing is worse than indifference. And so we gather sort of third hand that her book was a success. It wasn't a financial success, but it did set her name in people's minds. It did get, it did get its way into lending libraries and whatnot. But, uh, very quickly, her story, if it was ever meant to be the primary story in this book, fades into the background in favor of <laughs> in favor of two scoundrels, one large, one small. The book is populated by scoundrels, people who uh, whose stupidity is matched by their cupidity. But there are two in particular that we spend a lot of time with. One is Lady Carberry's wasteful son, Sir Felix, who is not one of these wastrel young men in Trollope. He has a he has a pattern with these with these young men. They're always beautiful. They're always as beautiful as Apollo. Uh, and they're always shallow and they're always self centered. But sometimes Trollope likes them for all that. And sometimes even contrives to save them. Uh, not so with Felix Carberry. <laughs> Felix Carberry is just a blight on humanity. There he never does anything right. He never does anything decent. Which we can't say if you think back to, for instance, the Palisher novels. Uh, we have uh, Lady Glencora's erstwhile lover, or the, the first young man that, that the young man that she would have married impe impetuously out of passion, uh, was just such a figure, beautiful, a wastrel, having thrown away every opportunity that life has given him. But he was also nice. He was also kind, and. Uh, Sir Felix Carberry is not that way at all. And the other uh, scoundrel that we deal with is a much, much bigger version of the same thing, and that is Mr. Melmott, a uh, foreign financier who has taken over London. He has taken London by storm in the last 11 months and consorts with 
emperors and with noblemen and with lords and earls and dukes and whatnot, uh, throws money around like it was going out of style, holds lavish events. As we're told in the, in the final chapters that we're reading today, we're finishing this book today, uh, he mesmerized society because he has a big house. Uh, and has all sorts of financial and speculative deals that are that are ongoing and that never seem to involve actual hard cash uh, early on in the book and early on in our discussion of the book I raised the idea that maybe fewer people in the London that Trollope is depicting here were really completely taken in by Mr. Melmont as seems it, it's, it's hard to credit the version of London that Trollope gives us here of one in which everyone is not only greedy but stupid. Quite a few of the characters that we meet in this book would, in their normal course of events, be able to figure Mr. Melmot out and know that there's no there there, that there's no there's no bottom on the barrel, uh, so to speak. And yet it doesn't seem that way in the, in the chapters, the concluding chapters that we're reading today. One character says, oh, he, he took us all in. He fooled us all. And that just doesn't seem possible. But Mr. Melmot has many schemes throughout the book and works to get himself elected to the House of Commons, uh, which is, a, in, as you will remember from the Palliser novels, as far as Trollope's concerned, that is the pinnacle of human achievement, to get yourself elected to Parliament. Uh, Melmot does, even though he is himself totally unworthy, uh, and a bounder. He has no idea how to behave in Parliament. He doesn't know anything about it, except that it's a thing that other men covet, and therefore he must have it. Uh, but the whole course, the whole while that he's doing that, he is also conducting swindles and getting, flying closer and closer to the sun and relying on the discretion of his longtime servant, his longtime assistant, Mr. Kroll, and lie, relying also on the subservience of his daughter, Marie, who has a disastrous romantic attachment to Felix Carberry that is totally wasted. We know that. We know that she may never come to realize, at least in the course of the book, we, we start to think she'll never see what a waste of time he is. Uh, but she also has had a large sum of money settled on her by her father. It's completely inviolable. It's, un, it's untouchable by him. It's hers. And it's, a, it's enough for the whole family to live on, and it was intended to be that way. He has always thought, in the back of his mind, he is a vagabond swindler. So in the back of his mind, he's thinking this could all just fall apart. And if it does, I'll need a backup. Uh, we see that side of Melmot. He is the grand man. He is the seigneur who holds these grand parties most of the time. But when the pressure starts to mount, we see that Melmot come out more and more clearly in these final chapters. When he tells his wife, for instance, make sure to have your jewels ready. And make sure that they're in packages, in parcels that you can carry in your hand and have them near you in case all of this ends, which is not the kind of advice that you give to someone. <laughs> That's the kind of advice you give to your wife if you're expecting to have to flee your house at night from the police or mob or both. <laughs> That's not that's not sound fiscal advice. That's the advice of a carpet-bagging adventurer. Uh, and she doesn't seem much surprised by that <laughs> at all. And uh, this becomes even more pointed because Marie Melmont has found a spine in the course of this novel and will not yield to her father. She will not she will not guarantee that that money is his to do with what he wants. And so he forges her name on all of the documents that he needs to. He also forges his, his servant's name, Kroll's name, on all of them except for one. In his haste, he leaves one spot undone, much like uh, Cardinal Wolsey in Shakespeare's Henry VIII. He is undone by his own paperwork, by an oversight of his own. There's no one to blame but himself. Uh, and in the course of the chapters that we're reading today, he knows that. It, it dawns on him that he knows that. That, that, that the jig is up, basically. He has, he has uh, the first scene of his that we see in Parliament is when he doesn't know when to, when to stand, who to address, whether or not to take his hat off. It's just a, a total anomaly in that chamber. He doesn't belong there, no matter how much his money and influence got him in. In the second virtuoso scene where he goes to Parliament. That is in the chapters that we're reading today. He's drunk on brandy and falls over. <laughs> he stands up, grips the chair in front of him, can't really find the words to say anything. He just wants to be defiant in the face of his ruin. He doesn't want these people to see him weak, and as, as a result, they, they see him incredibly weak. And then he overcompensates and falls over the member in front of him uh, it's a, and, and manages to regain his feet and stagger out. But no one, as we're told, no one looked at him and no one approached him. 
a very different thing from when he was glad handing his way from one end of the chamber to the other because everyone felt like they owed him a favor or wanted one in the future. And even then, we are told by Trollope, uh, we are given a characterization of this man. This is the, the, the bottom of Melmoth's life. This is, this is him hitting rock bottom. And often, even when Trollope has taken pains to make a villain out of someone, he will feel a bit of sympathy in that moment. But not so with Melmoth. We're told this. Though he was inquiring into himself as closely as he could, he never even told himself that he had been dishonest. Fraud and dishonesty had been the very principle of his life, and had so become a part of his blood and bones that even in this extremity of his misery he made no question within himself as to his right judgment in regard to them. Not to cheat, not to be a scoundrel, not to live more luxuriously than others by cheating more brilliantly was a condition of things to which his mind never turned itself. Uh, that, and I, I don't want to spoil the book for those of you who aren't, who aren't, uh, who aren't up to, to this point yet, but uh, it's at that point that we leave Mr. Melmont. We leave him at rock bottom. Uh, and w that leads us to a quality of Trollope novels, especially the longer ones, that I have mentioned before. We've been reading a lot of Trollope on this channel. So you are probably familiar, if you've been doing these read-alongs, you've been, you're probably familiar with it too, which is that uh, Trollope likes to say long goodbyes. He likes to, he likes a very long, soft twilight of an end to a book. He's perfectly willing to have a character come to an abrupt end. Uh, think of uh, the main character in The Prime Minister. He throws himself in front of a train <laughs> and is blown to bloody atoms. Well, he's perfectly willing to do that, but his overall story, this massive piece of, mach of professional machinery that has some major plots and minor plots, major and minor characters going through all sorts of upheavals, Trollope likes to, sit, to wind those things down very slowly very peacefully so that so that you're not left with any questions about what happens to any of these characters he was very aware by the time by the time he wrote this book he was a seasoned professional he was a literary figure that was known to everyone in in the reading world and had done a lot of writing but so by the time he got to this point he knew perfectly well that even a very minor character could be somebody's favorite he had seen that happen in his own novels where he'd given a minor subplot to a character and then been inundated with mail from readers who wanted to know more and more about that character. So he makes sure to give us endings, just all around endings, uh, and to do it slowly and to do it very completely. We watch as every one of these characters matches up with some other character and goes their way and has their ending. We learn the ending of Sir Felix. We Mar Marie Melmont does indeed uh, find a swain. <laughs> uh, and even Mrs. Carberry, even Lady Carberry, uh, eventually accepts a suitor and marries, and seems, from the little that we're told, to have a happy ending, one of the only unmitigatedly happy endings in this book. We are told that her literary soirees every Tuesday night at her house, as a married woman, were even more successful than they had been when she wasn't, than when they had been just as her own. Uh, and we're also told something else about her, because there's, there's a detail that I want to read you here to remind you that when Trollope turned his satirical eye on all of London, he included himself. Uh, that, that digging noise you hear in the background is, of course, Frida, <laughs> who is once again burrowing on the bed to try and find something comfortable. And it's petulance. It's pure petulance when she does that, because the, the comfort that she's looking for is me. <laughs> and when I'm making a video, when I'm sitting up and making a video, she can't be laying against me. So she protests by digging. <laughs> but anyway, I want to read you a bit uh, about uh, Lady Carberry when she's in her misery. When all the, she's miserable for her son. She loves him when no one else does. She believes in him when no one else does, even though she knows what he's like. Uh, and yet, she keeps working. And that is Trollope. <laughs> I want to read you this. Uh, indeed, she had hardly completed the last chapter of her Criminal Queens before she was busy on another work. And although the last six months had been to her a period of incessant trouble, and sometimes of torture, though the conduct of her son had more than once forced her to declare herself that her mind would fail her, still she persevered. From day to day, with all her cares heavy upon her, she had sat at her work with a firm resolve that so many lines should, be written, should always be forthcoming, let the difficulty of, the, of making them be what it might. Her publishers had thought that, it might be just, that they might be justified in offering her certain terms for a novel, 
terms not very high indeed, but those contingent on the approval of the manuscript by their reader. The smallness of the sum offered and the want of certainty and the pain of the work in her present circumstances had all been felt by her to be very hard, but she had persevered, and the novel was now complete. We are told in Trollope's autobiography, which he had published posthumously and which hurt his reputation quite a bit, we're, we're told what his wife also mentions uh, in letters and in a stated conversation to friends, which is that when he was finished with the book, he always had another one ready. I can't help but think there's a grudging tone of admiration there, or at least, if not admiration, marginal approval for Lady Cadbury, or for Lady, uh, Lady Carberry, and I think that's why she's given a more or less good ending. There's, there's nothing in her, in the, in the conclusion of her own story that is quite so desperate or random or unworthy <laughs> as the stuff that's in the conclusion of almost everybody else's story. So, uh, so that actually brings us to the end of uh, The Way We Live Now, and a sneeze, a trollop sneeze. <coughs> uh, this was a big one. This was We started off our year of consorting with Lonely Trollops with the, with the biggest Lonely Trollop of them all. There's another huge one that's out there. It's a massively depressing work, so I didn't want to start right away with it. Despite the fact that The Way We Live Now is so harsh and so dark in its tones, it is, I think, incredibly entertaining. Uh, but even so, <laughs> even so, we can do better. <laughs> we can do better for in terms of entertainment. And I have such a thing in mind for our next Lonely Trollop for April. And that is going to be Mr. Scarborough's Family, uh, which Trollope wrote many, many years after The Way We Live Now. This was, in, by, by most accounts, his last major novel. Uh, and it is a hoot. <laughs> it, is, it is a very legal book. Trollope was, was fascinated by the legal world, and it is a very legal book, but not at all dry. Not at all. And don't let that, this is the old Oxford cover, don't let that fool you either. This is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. I, I, the darker Trollope novels that we can get to later in the year, I'd like to wait until we're all not in a dark place. So let's, let's do this next. Now this has 64 chapters, so that's 16 chapters a week for April. So, uh, so let's see here for uh, for next weekend. Let me get to the uh, to the table of contents for for next weekend. We want to read from chapter number one, which is Mr. Scarborough, in which he's introduced uh, to let's see here, Mr. and Miss Gray. Uh, so the first sixteen chapters of Mr. Scarborough's family that will be for next Sunday. Uh, and I want to wrap this up, of course, by thanking you all for being company with the way we live now. I never never tire of rereading this book and to read it in in uh the company of friends is just so much the better <laughs> so, so i want to thank you for that and we will move right on we will no matter what other read-alongs we might do we'll move right on to mr scarborough's family for april uh so i'll wrap this up and i'll see you then thank you book two